Hello, I'm Marites Vito. Welcome to Southeast Asia Speaks. This is the show where I get to interview resource persons and newsmakers on issues affecting the region. I will be speaking to Ashley Townshend of the University of Sydney. He is with the United States Studies Center, where he is Director of Foreign Policy and Defense. Ashley works on international security and strategic affairs with focus on Indo-Pacific, including regional alliances and partnerships. We will be talking about AUKUS, or the Australia, United Kingdom, United States Security Partnership, and what it means for us in the region. Ashley is joining us from Sydney, Australia. Thank you so much, Ashley, for making time for this interview. Thanks for having me, Marites. Great to be with yes. you. Of course, the first question is, you know, here in the Philippines, maybe we're not uh, very fully attuned yet to what is this new uh, partnership. So what is the core of AUKUS? Well, uh, it's a great question because I think there's been a lot of um, misunderstanding around what AUKUS is and, and really what it isn't. Um, and, and I'll start with what it isn't. AUKUS is not an alliance. It is not a, about strategic policy coordination. It's not about bringing together the US and the UK and Australia to do things in the region to undertake military operations or to or to undertake um, maritime patrols or things like that. AUKUS at its core is really about um, defense industrial cooperation and it's really about finding a better way to share more sensitive technologies, technical know-how, um, advanced innovation and so forth with a defense application between uh, three countries that already share quite a lot with each other when it comes to intelligence and when it comes to um, uh, defense and military capabilities more broadly. Um, and, and in that way, really what AUKUS is, is a, a partnership for, um, for improving on something that already exists, which is um, the role of uh, Australia and the UK in what's called the United States National Technology and in, in Industrial Base. Uh, which was uh, formalized in 2017 to include Australia and the UK, but really hasn't led to Australia and the UK getting much greater access either into or technology out of the United States in ways uh, beyond the ordinary. So AUKUS at its core will provide a framework for Australia and the United States and the UK to start more effectively sharing, more quickly sharing and partnering with each other on highly advanced technology with a military capability output. The submarine deal, which has got all of the attention, or in fact, yeah. not the deal, but the agreement to start looking at a way to provide Australia with nuclear propulsion for a new fleet of submarines, um, is the first project that will go through this framework. But in fact, um, that will take decades to come to full fruition and really we'll see progress much more quickly in areas like artificial intelligence, um, advanced undersea autonomous vehicles, um, 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 uh, munitions, uh, and cyber capabilities in the short term. So that's really, I think, how we should be thinking about AUKUS. So AUKUS is not time bound. There is no like a 10 year lifespan because you said it will take quite some time even to uh, fulfill what are in the talking points of AUKUS. Uh, it will take quite some time to deliver um, a nuclear-powered submarine capability to Australia or for Australia, in fact, um, as is the plan, to build it uh, itself here in this country. Um, but the framework of AUKUS and even the framework for the submarine technology um, sharing component is likely to be up and running much sooner. Um, it's anticipated that over the next 18 months, the three countries will look at and formalise a path forward for this important um, uh, nuclear propulsion technology sharing arrangement, which goes within the AUKUS framework. But the submarine um, aspect and AUKUS itself are not the same thing. AUKUS is the larger vehicle. And through that, 
over the balance of this decade, I expect that we'll see a lot of technology cooperation leading to a whole range of new innovations, you know, ideally um, a defence free trade zone of some kind between Britain, Australia and the United States that will be developing a range of capability. For example, for Australia, we really want um, support in particular from the United States with sharing the technical um, uh, skills and know-how to seed an Australian um, ecosystem to manufacture um, uh, missiles, long-range uh, um, precision munitions here in this country. It's something which Australia's Defence Minister Peter Dutton made clear heading to Washington last month for the AUKUS announcement and for the annual 2 plus 2 Osmin talks. That's just one example of, um, of another thing that could go through the AUKUS range, um, framework rather in the short term. There's no time-bound um, um, there's no end date for AUKUS. It's neither a project nor is it an alliance. It is a vehicle for doing business. In some ways, it's similar to the Five Eyes arrangement. The Five Eyes arrangement is not an alliance. It's a, it's a partnership for the sharing of intelligence. There are certain things that those countries don't agree on when it comes to foreign and defence policy, in particular the role of New Zealand um, uh, not aligning as closely with Australia and the United States when it comes to Five Eyes um, foreign policies. But in fact, they still have a partnership. It is not time bound. It is still very practical and useful for all parties. You should think of AUKUS as being a similar kind of thing, except instead of sharing uh, intelligence, it's about sharing and partnering on defense um, high-tech um, 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 projects. But tell us about the timing, because um, China sees this as an, an attempt to thwart their, its rise, I mean, in the region as well as in the world. So why, why now? Why AUKUS now? Uh, so there are two parts to that question. In terms of the why now, um, Australia was at a point in the submarine um, uh, development program with, with France where it really needed um, um, to make a, a key decision, either to really proceed uh, with those conventional powered uh, um, diesel electric submarines, which had been plagued already by cost overruns, uh, by budget overruns, sorry, uh, timeline overruns as well, and so forth, and was technically a very difficult enterprise because we were trying to refit uh, in partnership with the French conventionally power uh, nuclear powered um, um, uh, submarines um, as per the French version of that platform with conventional propulsion systems as per the Australian aspiration. So we needed to make a decision, Australia needed to make a decision about that. And really it was the worst kept secret in Australian uh, defence policy circles that no one was um, was confident that the French model was going to be a successful one. And meanwhile, in the five years since the French program uh, more or less had been determined, Australia's uh, um, uh, uh, assessment of its strategic environment, that is the same strategic environment in which uh, our listeners today are a part of, has deteriorated so quickly so as to um, imply for Australian decision makers that a, new, a conventionally powered submarine would not uh, be fit for purpose for uh, Australian policy objectives. And we can talk about what those are later. So the, the why now was really that Australia either needed to confirm that path ahead with the French or find an alternative solution. And the decision was made to find an alternative solution. AUKUS was therefore born. And the reason that a three-way agreement needed to be, um, to be developed, uh, really, or at least from my perspective, is that although it is much more likely that the British will be the ones who, who create the model uh, or the prototype, if you like, for the Australian boat that will purchase through this arrangement. Uh, British nuclear powered submarine technology is also derived from that of the Americans under the 1958 agreement between those two countries. So the consent of Washington was required before Britain could even begin um, um, talking with Australia about developing that kind of submarine for, for our country. So that's why it made sense to bring Britain um, in as well. And the United States had to give it that blessing. We are now going to see um, um, what the design is put forward over the next 18 months. But I suspect it will be a British build because US um, naval shipyards are too constrained really to produce um, um, a, a Virginia class or any other, any other submarine for Australia, Australia. need a new design. Um, when it comes to the Chinese reaction um, and, and the question about timelines, well, look, 
insofar as the submarine is concerned, it doesn't add up. Um, the submarine, whether it was the French one or whether it is this new British American Australian design, when that comes to fruition, won't be in the water for at least uh, 15 years from now. That was true of both submarine models. The numbers of the submarines that Australia will acquire have fallen slightly. Their quality and effectiveness has increased uh, significantly. You might say that on balance, Australia is going to have a more sophisticated capability, and that is, of course, true. It will have much more capacity to take part in allied operations further from Australia's, uh, you know, from, from the Australian continent, uh, right along the first island chain, you know, stretching down from Japan, Taiwan, uh, and, and onwards to, to the Philippines. Um, so China is concerned about that, but that is still a long way in the future. Uh, in the short term, what China doesn't want to see, as I'm sure all of our viewers um, are well aware, is, is alliance, is alliance um, um, uh, strengthening across the region. And that has, in fact, been happening for some time. Uh, in my view, um, the AUKUS development is not the beginning of the process of um, the deepening of the US-Australia alliance. It's really another node on what has been a 10-year um, 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 effort by both sides of politics in Australia, beginning in 2011 with the US-Australia force posture initiatives to really strengthen American military posture here in this country, to find ways to more effectively work together as defence partners in the region and in support of third countries in the region, especially in Southeast Asia, and to do that on a scale um, that we haven't done before. Uh, so in that sense, the, the progress towards alliance integration and the progress towards Australia playing a much more active role as an upholder of security in the Indo-Pacific has a long pedigree. It was championed in the 2017 Foreign Policy White Paper and again last year by the much acclaimed 2020 Defence Strategic Update that was um, endorsed by many countries in ASEAN and is ultimately about Australia playing a bigger role alongside the US, Japan and other regional countries to collectively uh, maintain a balance of power in the region, noting that the United States won't be able to do that by itself. So China is not happy with that strategic trajectory of Australia, um, but the submarine component of that is still a long, long way away. So what about uh, its impact on Southeast Asia? What does um, because some of our leaders, of course, Singapore welcomed it, the Philippines welcomed it, but Duterte, in a speech here in the Philippines, or at least quoted by his spokesperson, aired some concerns about nuclear proliferation. And But Malaysia, I think, has uh, also aired some concerns. So what do you think is the impact on Southeast Asia and what should be done to allay these fears? Yeah, look, that's a really, really important question. And, and as uh, one of my colleagues at the US Study Centre, Susanna Patton, has written, um, it's really incumbent on the Australian government, but, but all three capitals involved in AUKUS, to take seriously uh, the concerns in Southeast Asia around the way that AUKUS was announced, as well as the what it will entail, and to address those you know, privately in bilateral forums, in ASEAN forums over the coming months and, and years, in fact. Um, you're right that the reaction from Southeast Asia has has been mixed, uh, and, and I think many would have expected that there to be on this particular issue no uniform um, ASEAN position. Um, you know, part of the reason for uh, the concern that you referred to, particularly in Malaysia and Indonesia, I think has to do with the way that this agreement was was announced. Um, for, for many people, it looked like a new alliance was born. It looked like the red, white and blue flags that were splashed all over primetime television across the world um, was the signal of a return to an Anglospheric model of, of the Australian government's uh, foreign policy, when in fact it was nothing of the sort. Um, it was really, you know, the political um, overtones um, governing, I think, that, that sort of spectacle um, um, might have served the individual interests of the four men in question, but in fact, don't really uh, signify the strategic logic of AUKUS nor its its true purpose. So firstly, it's important to explain what AUKUS isn't, and that is it's not an alliance in that regard. Uh, but I think it's also, it's also very valid that regional countries are concerned uh, that the decisions uh, that, that Australia or the United States indeed uh, take in order to strengthen the balance of power or 
improve our ability to play a military role in deterring uh, Chinese adventurism in the future don't themselves contribute to instability in the region. That is um, certainly what lies behind, I think, the Indonesian concern and one might argue more broadly amongst onlookers in Southeast Asia. I think there are a couple of ways to address that. Uh, first is, you know, going back to the core principles in, in Australia's foreign and defence policy, most recent white papers, um, the shaping of the strategic environment and the working with regional countries to ensure sovereign autonomy, to ensure adherence to the rules-based order, to ensure where regional countries want it, uh, that Australia is able and willing to play a supportive defence and security partnership role with regional countries, really what we need to emphasise front and centre um, as AUKUS translates from defence cooperation into capability application in the region. And indeed, once we start looking at the kinds of operations that Australia might undertake with some of its new capabilities that it is acquiring through AUKUS and other, and other um, vehicles, we'll indeed need to make sure that we signal well ahead, of, well ahead of time to regional countries what those are, what their purpose is, uh, and how they will not just add to deterrence, but also not um, increase regional instability. I think that's achievable. Um, the 2020 Defence Strategic Update last year, as I mentioned before, was, was very much um, welcomed in Southeast Asia and more broadly in the region, of course not in Beijing, but more broadly in the region. Um, in particular, in the Philippines and Indonesia, there was support for that white paper. And that white paper, um, in many ways, foreshadowed the capability Australia will acquire through AUKUS, um, including things like more advanced submarines, including things like um, much bigger um, 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 inventories of much longer range precision strike weapons. Uh, we can talk about the applications of those if you like, but I think in terms of allaying regional concerns, I think it's important to explain to regional countries where those capabilities will actually add value to the defence of regional countries' exclusive economic zones and territorial waters, where they provide a capacity for Australia to not be on the wrong side of, if you like, a, a military escalation cycle vis-a-vis -vis China. So giving Australia more room to play its role as a middle power in support of its neighbours. And finally, I think it's also important that wherever possible, we find those synergies between the ADF, the Australian Defence Force, and regional militaries, um, including, um, 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 sorry, by regional, I mean Southeast Asian militaries, but including those major defence partners as well, like the US and Japan, to take part in multilateral you know, confidence building measures, multilateral military exercises, high end and low end, according to the appetite and, and, the, and, the, and the willingness of regional countries. And it's that kind of military diplomacy that is the best way of building transparency. So you think this is going to have a direct impact on the maritime disputes in the South China Sea? In what way will AUKUS, <coughs> AUKUS have an impact that in this contentious area of the region? So AUKUS itself won't have an impact on, on any kind of dispute. Again, it's a framework for defence cooperation. The submarines, if we fast forward you know, to the optimistically to the late 2030s or perhaps later, um, Australian nuclear powered submarines would absolutely um, um, have the kind of capability to play a much more you know, sophisticated and advanced role in, in um, defending you know, the status quo as it currently stands in the South China Sea, the territorial status quo and the maritime status quo against um, potential Chinese aggression. Uh, the kinds of submarines that Australia is acquiring will not only um, be able to uh, spend much more time on operations in parts of the region like the South China Sea, they'll be able to lie and wait in choke points in and out of the South China Sea like Sunda Strait and Lombok Strait and others. Uh, where they will be able to play a, an important role in preventing Chinese submarines and surface ships exiting the South China Sea to pose a threat to regional countries or US forces trying to defend regional countries in the event of a crisis. But Australian submarines in that context, again, in the future, will also be able to play uh, a role coordinating with other allied militaries in the region um, quite before a military crisis to send a signal to China that you know, seizing more territory in the South China Sea, going further than it has now, trying to seize 
particular parts of the south of the first island chain, whether that be islands owned by Japan or Taiwan, whether that be Taiwan itself, whether that be territories um, of the of the Philippine archipelago and other parts of Southeast Asia, is not worth the candle because of the kinds of coordinated, federated military capabilities that regional major defence partners, including Australia in this future, would have together and would be able to dissuade China, therefore, from testing their resolve. So I think that there is, at the very high end, a stabilising role of those submarines far into the future. In the short term, a much a more powerful Australian defence force um, will be more able to play an active um, uh, role in exercising presence in the South China Sea, in exercising presence in disputed waters more broadly in the Indo-Pacific or in upholding sea lane security through the Indo-Pacific, that is to say from the Indian Ocean through maritime Southeast Asia and onwards to the Pacific or, 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 or northwards up to the East China Sea. Um, that kind of Australian role could be enabled by some of the technology that we'll be pursuing through AUKUS, be that advanced autonomous systems, be that, um, 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 the, as I mentioned before, the more formidable um, precision strike capabilities that Australia will be acquiring, be that cyber technology and electronic warfare. When we have an, an Australian ADF that is able to be a much more potent uh, contributor um, in the region, Australia will feel itself perhaps more confident in exercising presence in thorny parts of regional disputes where regional militaries or regional fishing vessels or commercial vessels or other government ships are being harassed by Chinese uh, maritime militia and Chinese naval forces. It's something which Australia already plays a role in, but I think that this kind of enhanced military capability of the ADF will provide a lot more options for Australia to exercise a helpful partnership with regional countries in those disputed waters. Yes, a yes. Final, a final, a final question. question. Um, uh, I think I'm having, think I'm an, having echo. an echo. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> final, final question. question. <laughs> is, is, um, do you see this? Some people, I don't want to use the phrase Cold War because it's an old one, but do you see this as a cold, a new Cold War uh, where in US and China again are... Um, fighting against each other ideologically in this part of the world. You know, look, it's such a, a loaded term, isn't it, Marita, uh, that it's a, it's a difficult one to come at. If you, you always disappoint someone if you say it is a new Cold War, it isn't a new Cold War. Let me approach the question this way. Uh, it's, it's not a US-China Cold War because the United States is not in it by itself. Um, and I think it's important to note that countries like Australia are not taking direction from Washington when they pursue new arrangements like AUKUS or when they pursue new force posture initiatives, the kind of which Australia and the US um, 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 announced also last month. It was a bit overshadowed by the submarine arrangement. Um, but on the contrary, Australia is, is, is absolutely driving that agenda. It is seeking to ensure, as it has always said that it would, the strongest possible forward US presence in the region, one that will be able to contribute both to the direct defence of Australia, but also to the upholding of the regional order as they see it. For Japan, it's very much the same thing. Uh, Japan is also moving much more quickly now towards um, improving its own capacity legislatively in terms of military capabilities, hopefully in terms of military budget, to be able to contribute to collective self-defence. That's another really important uh, country for upholding a regional balance of power more effectively. India is playing a much larger role, of course, as our viewers know, through the Quad, and, and so on and so forth in terms of major powers. All three, all four of those countries and all three of those regional countries are also proliferating exponentially their, their defence ties, their security ties, but also their economic development ties, diplomatic ties with Southeast Asian countries, with Northeast Asian countries in, in the South Pacific and in South Asia. So there's a real, um, 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 you know, the agenda is being driven in many ways by regional countries themselves, not by Washington in the proliferation of these arrangements. And that is distinctive from, uh, from a bilateral uh, understanding of the Cold War. Um, but I'd also make the point that, you know, at the start of the Cold War, 
you did see, or certainly in its early its earlier period, you did see these kinds of ambitious defence technology partnerships being born. And of course, it was in 1958 that the Brits and the Americans um, um, sealed their deal for American nuclear powered uh, submarine technology to be to be shifted to London. Um, so you know, it is a sign of the times um, of a major. Um, new era in world politics in, in regional security to see Washington give away and agree to empower a, a key ally like Australia in this way. And I think that that is, uh, you know, it's not an action that's taken in isolation. We've seen Washington undertake similar uh, kinds of allied empowerment initiatives with Japan, with South Korea, and for instance, the lifting of the missile defense guidelines in that country and in other parts of the region as well, we can anticipate to see more of that. So those sorts of major moves are indicative of the opening of a new period in, in, in sort of regional geostrategic uh, dynamics. Um, you might say that that's a bit similar to the opening round of the Cold War, but I think it's certainly true to say that the nature of the competition that is now going to play out and is already playing out will be very different from that of the Cold War period. Wow, thank wow, you very thank much. You very I, much. I learned a lot from, from uh, this uh, conversation. And you know what also was clarified here is the role of Australia as a middle power you mentioned in the region. And I think in the Philippines, we've had cooperation with Australia in terms of security. We have been receiving aid, I think, um, from Australia. But on that for enlightening us on this new part called listeners. We will keep uh, watching this development as the economists describe it. It's a tectonic shift in the region. And uh, well, but we're all sort of um, occupied with our elections in 2022. But I think this is going to be an issue as well in, in upcoming uh, discussions on foreign relations. Again, thank you so much, Ashley. And thank you to our viewers and listeners. And we will um, stay again tuned to AUKUS and other developments in the region. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Marites. Bye-bye.